AskGunQuestions.com. AskGunQuestions.com is a website that we built back in 2007. And since then, for the last 15 years, people have been able to ask questions of simple to advanced nature, and we attempt to answer them in different ways over the years. Join us now as we start a new series to answer gun questions. And welcome everybody to our Ask Gun Questions show. We got uh, Tony Simon jumping in on the road in Virginia. Thanks for joining. Thanks a lot. And Clover joining us, I think, just is sitting at home at Texas in Texas. Thanks for jumping in. Good to be here. All right. So, uh, and I'm in Arizona. So we go live every Saturday, and we answer questions. You can ask those questions here live or anytime at askgunquestions.com. So we'll take a look at those. Uh, no questions in the chat this morning. Uh, we started a little bit late, uh, thanks to my co-host, the puppy. But uh, thanks everybody for your patience. We're uh, going live here. We've got uh, people that are joining us live. Woods is out there. Good afternoon, Plain Nut, Tim Company. Happy to do so. And Roy is out there as well. So if you're out there and you want to say hey, let us know if you got questions. Drop them in there. Clover was gone last week doing some kind of a, I couldn't tell if it was a swap meet or a gun show. So want to tell us about how that went? Was it any fun? Yeah, it's, um, you know, shilling rifles or shilling rifle barrels uh, up the road, you know, a couple of hours here or so. And um, I had never been. They do a, a swap meet every year around the same time. And I don't know how long it's been going on. I don't remember now, but a decade or more. Uh, it's been going on for a long time. And I've never been. Um, but, yeah, it's really neat. I mean, they open up their uh, – you know, I didn't stay a super long time. It's the first time we'd ever been. Uh, we just kind of went up there, walked through, and, and made that part of, a, you know, a, a stop for some road tripping that we did last Saturday. But, um, yeah, they kind of open up their shop. And, you know, all their machinery and they, you know, they're not like balls to the wall cranking out barrels, but they're working on, you know, making them and, and doing things. The machines are running right at a slower pace, I would say, kind of. And they have um, like police tape up where, you you know, you can't cross and get into the machinery area, but you're close enough. You can still see what's going on. Um, and so their guys will, will walk around and, and, you know, chop a barrel and thread a barrel and, and drill a barrel and right you know bore up run the bore and do the rifling and so that was kind of neat and then um outside they would um they've got this i don't know a grassy knoll type area and um they it's more set up kind of like a gun show like people can bring in as far as i know i don't think there was any dealers there at all period it was just people random people but uh basically they pulled up kind of like uh, out of their trunk almost, right? Like, you know, they backed into the like spot. In swap meet. Through the, like in a yeah. swap meet. It's essentially a parking lot and everybody's in there coming out of their trunk. Yeah, like they let the tailgate down on their truck and set all their stuff out or they, you know, have a folding table and they, you know, Super set cool. on their trunk and, you know, or whatever in other car and, you know, put their stuff on the folding table. Uh, and there was, I don't know, there was, I'm trying to think about how many, I, you know, couple of hundred i mean at the very very most you know let's say a hundred maybe minimum um so yeah it was an interesting thing to see that you know you got a barrel company that just one of the little events they decided to years and years and years ago again decade plus they decided to kind of put together which is uh it's, it's kind of neat and i do have several of their barrels by the way so it's like i i I, that's why I say I've known for a while that the swap meet and everything has existed. And yeah, that sounds pretty cool. I think that it would be an advantage for any gun shop to create something like that on an event, do it, you know, quarterly or something, and then uh, give customers a chance to meet each other and to kind of sell stuff out of their junk, out of their, you know, past hobbies and out of the stuff they've outgrown or uh, just evolved past or whatever. And then, uh, you yeah, know, this sounds pretty cool. Anyway, so uh, did you buy anything? No, definitely not. No. Was it guns then, or was it was guns and stuff, right? It wasn't. Oh, just yeah. Stuff. Yeah. 
baseball cards and stuff. Oh, yeah. No, no. It was fact you couldn't have stuff like that. I mean, it had to be. Uh, they're like absolutely no, you know, beef jerky, jewelry, random, non firearm outdoor related. I mean, it pretty much has to be all related to that. So, no gold coins and no, no stuff like that. They've got a policy of that. So, it was guns, ammo, accessories, you know, um, things that you would typically see, you know, that make up the vast majority of gun shows. That's basically what was there. Any pictures? No, uh-uh. No, it was just, uh, you know, Whatever. enjoying the, enjoying think, the day. Think about thing. making content for the internet once in a while. Mm, well, got to think about um, just kind of chilling and relaxing and taking a break and doing your own thing, too, at some point. And that was kind of what that was, was, hey, I'm going to go walk through and check that out. And I'm not, you know, just, I just want to chill, you know, like. I can talk about it and everything, but I mean, what are the odds, you know, somebody from way off somewhere else is like, Ooh, I got to go to that. Like, it's, you know, other than the fact that it exists, you know, I got to think that most of the people that go to that are, you know, maybe they're from the DFW area. Cause it's not that far from there. I mean, man, I'd say less than an hour South, you know, well, that's um, a, but this, this is the whole point is to archive it because there's tons of people I've petitioned for gun shows my whole life and there's tons of, most everybody hates gun shows or has no opinion or hates them. It's like a sub thing to hate inside of guns and nobody disagrees with you usually. Yeah. So uh, when you have a con conversation with people about gun shows and they go, there's no relevance, they're completely useless. Being able to point to something like an event like that one, which is relevant, authentic and traditional and useful right uh, would be great because people that never experienced something like that don't understand you know they never they just have to understand their experience it. anyway uh, so um thanks for sharing it with us uh tony's driving um we're we've got a couple of questions coming in i'm guessing those are people that are joining us tonight because they're this afternoon because they're just now coming in but jumping over to questions the first one is 85 year old Dad carries a Taurus 85 Poly. Nice. It's a polymer Taurus with mm -hmm. sub, like a small revolver. Yeah, those would are all. He, would he be better off with one of the Easy Rack Mini Wonder Nines? Basically, what's a good elderly CCW? He carries outside the waistband three o'clock. So essentially, a standard outside the waistband carry. <clears throat> I don't think it. I don't think it would necessarily be uh, be better. He would be better off. Um, I don't. I don't have a nine millimeter any in any of my carry rotation. I'm trying to think. Do I? Nope. I don't. Um, and my protector poly is in my carry rotation. So, um, yeah. I'm I mean, a that's person, a, and I'm getting old, which is different than. I've never touched a gun before. I'm old and my kid tells me I got to have a gun. You know, there's there's a lot of variation in old people guns. Right. So pulling the trigger on a double action revolver. All right. I get that. That can be a, an effort that can be beyond the realm of the dexterity or whatever you call it, finger strength anymore when you get old enough. Uh, a little nine millimeter is still going to be a double action. Right. So it's maybe you could put a, a little single action in someone's hand and maybe that's a reason for the tiny single actions but then they have to have the dexterity and strength of their thumb to pull the safety off and at that yeah. point you know, there, there should be no nfa there should be guns that are designed for people that are uh, using their abilities with their hand strengths or when you're injured but without complaining I don't think there's a win. I think that it's possible to rack a nine millimeter ish type of thing, a 380. They were having conversations about this last night, I think. So, you know, give somebody a 380, that single action, like a Minx, whatever the 380 version of the Blue Beretta is. And uh, so you can rack it for them or not have to rack it at all, or they wouldn't have to rack it at all. And then hopefully there's no malfunctions, but that would eliminate some of the trigger. But now you're leaving a lot of variables, like you know, all the things that can happen with a semi. And when you don't have a lot of wrist strength and arm strength behind a semi-automatic is when it malfunctions. Well, and you've, got, you've, got the, you've got the Grisson MC-14T, 
that has yep. been leaked has been leaked at this point. It was supposed to be announced in NRA. Um, we got to see it. I got to see it at, uh, during the shot show. But yeah, it's a it's basically a Beretta Cheetah with a tip up barrel. So I mean, no racking involved. You know, got a pick rail and. <clears throat> But you also get into, um, you know, when you talk about deviating from the revolver, you know, depending on what you deviate into, you've got a lot more, if dexterity is an issue, then I think you complicate things more because you've got more uh, manipulation, right? More. Uh, well, and, you, and a semi-auto doesn't work if you put it in jello. So if you give an old person True. with how many arm strength a semi-auto, it's going to malfunction. So a revolver... You know, maybe removing the, the, the trigger pull on a revolver is the way to go. Well, I was or wondering why they're changing from why, why are they changing over? What's what's the point? I mean, if they've run this poly, did I miss here the question? The poly's already in the carry is already in the carry gun. Yeah, I'm just thinking it's got to be the trigger pull. So yeah, um, maybe the recoil. See, see if they can work on the trigger pull on that. Uh, send it to somebody and have them work on it. Uh, remains 100%. Maybe that might be the issue. Is, is that just need to work on that? That's why I had my 686 done. Um, and that double action trigger pull, I think, is between six and seven pounds now. And the single action trigger pull is, 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 is frightful. I mean, it took me a while to get used to it. It was so like. I think they uh, should make old people guns in like a color, right? Like a let's say some weird yellow color. Oh, the color of Pepto Bismol or something, old, old person medicine color. And then the trigger on that thing is essentially if you yell too loud next to that old person, that gun's going off. And then you give these old people these guns that all they got to do is think about pulling the trigger and it's it's shooting, right? And I'll bet you won't have any old people getting mugged no more. All I have to do is pull out that Metamucil-looking gun and every bad guy is going to start running because they know that old person is capable again. Ow. I actually hurt myself. That was funny. Um, and, and the funny part, though, you're talking about the color. Hey, uh, the color of that Gerson. 14 was an MC 14 T. They have one called like Sangria. It's mm -hmm. almost that color. It's like a purplish. I forgot what. The, I was just trying to pick like a, a unique color that when a bad guy sees it coming out of an old person's clothes or purse or something, they're running. It's like, uh oh, <laughs> that's that feather uh -oh. trigger gun that old people carry. <laughs> I mean, we're joking, but I, I tell you one thing that works. I mean, it, it's kind of. It's retro 100%. But uh, Taylor and Companies has a lot of what they call what a store clerk, store owner. They're single action revolvers that use a lot of shopkeepers. Yeah. Shop shopkeepers. shopkeepers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's I mean, a great thing. That's a really interesting idea. Are they heavy or are they like, is that an, that's not an aluminum gun? It's, it's not. not, but it has like a short barrel, barrel head, barrel head uh, grip. First hit grip, excuse me. And uh, now I, I want don't a little tiny Ruger. The Ruger made the, the aluminum. Firecat? Yeah, that thing is a shopkeep, right? A little tiny old person, semi or single action 22 aluminum frame, smaller than a J frame. You think that's crazy or would that be good for an old person? Again, depends on the trigger pull itself and the manipulation and what, what's the deal. Um, I've been blessed to have a diverse group of people actually take training classes, not just the first issue. And if your arthritis is too bad, it makes no difference. You know what I mean? Uh, you still have to be able to pull that trigger. What if there so, was a way to make one where the, you know how like the squeeze conquer on HK, if that's the single, that's the first action. And then, it, you know, so you grab it and by grabbing it, you're engaging the, the first action, you're cocking the hammer back. And then you have it in single action mode. So as long as you're holding it, it's single action ready to fire. As soon as you let go of it, it goes back to double action again. Or does that exist and I just haven't seen it? I have no, I know they had one that was shaped like a ball. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. I don't wonder what happened to that one. I could go look that up. Uh, I 
recently. It looked like a kidney or something with a tube sticking out of it, right? And it was like yeah, a 22 or something around. I heard around. about the owner of it, yeah. <clears throat> I heard about that. I reread that recently or something. I was but, also uh, thinking if there's some way to just do it as maybe as you extend your arm. So all you have to do is hold on to the thing. And then as you extend your arm, that action shoots it for you. For again, for old people. Yeah, but you got a lot of a sleeve gun from the old Wild West TV show ain't gonna really be cool. You know, the Derringer on the, the, up the sleeve. But yeah, small, small, one, if you already have a revolver and used to a revolver, see if you can get a trigger drop if that's the issue. Um, the simpler, the better, because yeah, when you have strength issues, uh, rocking a semi auto is only going to lead, I mean, can lead to limp wristing and causing malfunctions. And now there's just a whole other thing. And depending on the mentality of the person, I know a lot of older people want features on their semi-autos. They want a safety. They want a group safety. They want a thumb safety. Well, that's a whole new uh, set of manipulations you have to learn, especially if you're used to running a stump nose revolver. So if they're willing to put in time, they can have anything they want or try anything they want. Take them to a range. Take them to a rental range and be prepared to spend a little bit of money. Uh, one of the ranges, actually, in Virginia that I went to, they would... Uh, if you rent a gun, they would deduct the price of that gun off if you purchased that type of gun. Like, you know, you rented a Beretta just to see if you wanted to purchase one. And you go, yeah, I really like it. I want to buy this. When they knock the price of the rental off the price of the gun. Oh, yeah. I've actually seen that at a couple of shops. So, yeah. Well, it's saying that the... He used to carry a car nine, and then he had also said that the Gerson, he's seen it, but uh, the magazine issue, the state that he's in. So the capacity of that thing must be higher than 10, I guess. That's 14. Well, 13 plus one. Oh, no, he needs that many rounds. It's a, it's a dangerous number of rounds in some states. In other states, it's adequate. It's fine. Well, uh, again, uh, if you're worried about that, the easy and 380 is 10 rounds. I think the only one less than 10 rounds is New York. I think they pulled seven out of their butt for some reason. What if you were to put a rubber bumper on the front of the slide so that you could just poke it? You could grab the gun in a firing grip and smash it into the wall or poke it into something and that would rack it. Would that freak everybody out or would that allow people without dexterity or finger strength to rack their firearms. Call it a pogo stick. Because I know that when the zip huh? and they clover and they have a holster like that or something that you could actually rack it while it was in the holster. Oh, I remember that one. Yeah. That was yeah. in two thousand and nine NRA North Carolina. I think we did video of that. It might have been Shot Show also. I remember I've that guy. Some, I've seen some competition rigs that were Kind of like that. And then, of course, you have uh, the ring on the back of uh, the slide that can be put on the back. The, the wing slide. is probably better, yeah, because then that's less getting in the way of the muzzle and everything. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there are items around. They're just not really mainstream because it is a niche item. A niche item. Yeah. Well, as the baby boom, the largest generation that we've experienced, uh, ages will... Uh, see more and more attention given to this stuff i think i think i hope so so the next question is similar same person i think woods and it is the is the 380 acp ballistics similar to the 38 special because he carries both of them um i don't know do you know nope. top nope. Of your head? nope like 380 is not even close Okay, yeah, so I mean, thirty-eight special and nine millimeter are closer. Yeah, but understand that the three eighty is nine millimeter short, so no, it's not going to be. Uh, thirty-eight. I mean, the, the thirty-eight special was kind of more standard 
uh, grain weight is 158 grain bullet uh, for 380. It's 90 grain. So yeah, I mean, even that is significantly different. Yep. Capable, yes. You know, comparable, no. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, even a nine millimeter. If we were just talking grain weight, that's all we're talking about right now. Uh, standard training ammo most people use, and even a significant portion of self-defense ammo is 115 grain. Uh, though a lot of people use 124s, 148s now, but you can still see what I'm talking about with the 38 special and the nine millimeter being kind of sort of ballparking around the same thing. Yeah. Especially when you're talking self-defense ammo and plus P for 38 special, but yeah, um, it's it's a different world. Uh, you know that. 380 ACP, it, it's a, I mean, they were for vest pocket guns. They, they were for much smaller guns. I like the fact they've gotten bigger now because too small is difficult to use for anyone. Well, you've got, um, you've got some inherent issues with 38 Special that you're going to have in any revolver, you know, um, when you start talking about cylinder gap and the forcing cone. Um, so, I mean, it's not utilizing the, it's not utilizing the power of the charge, right? So um, it has a lot on paper, but that doesn't necessarily mean it equates to downrange energy and everything. Yeah. That's what, you know, when Tony said earlier, like the nine is way closer to the 38 special than a, than a 380. I would agree. But then I would also say you want to keep in mind that. In some instances, the nine could be better because of the, you know, just depending on what it's being fired out of and that sort of thing because of the, the ne negligible, yes, but still loss that you get from the cylinder gap and the forcing cone. So keep that in mind. But this whole notion that a 380 is not going to, oh, you know, uh, I live up north and, you know, somebody's wearing a heavy jacket, you know, a 380. Then what world will the 380 not penetrate a heavy jacket? You know? Yeah. I mean, especially using um, standard, uh, uh, regular ammo. Right. I mean, I'm sure that if you use some weird boutique, bougie thing that's not used by somebody, yeah, you'll probably, you could have issues because it doesn't have a track record. Right. But, but yeah. using, yeah, gold dot, HSTs, yeah, you'll, you'll be fine. I think a lot of people academically create more obstacles than there actually are. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I was just looking at um, 380 ammo in, you know, ballistics gel, which is, you know, a medium that's used as a consistent uh, whatever testing bed or whatever uh 380 goes about 10 inches into it and looks like 38 special goes more like 13 to 16 so i would say both of those are capable of going through clothing i mean i don't know what if you shot a bb gun into gel it's still going to go a couple inches in so a bb gun might bounce off of something actually let me see if there's bb gun ballistics gel because uh you know what i'm saying like in other words going through clothing, I agree with you, like, it's not a, a issue. It's just maybe how well it performs, but I don't think you're going to get any 380 that hollow point is designed to be super, you know. Okay, a 177 pellet going into ballistics gel is four inches. Uh, it's hard to say. Nobody's really doing much bb gun stuff but yeah bbs themselves go about three inches so that all uh, depends on distance it depends on the amount of air whatever power behind them well sure but There's just for generalities right? or whatever yeah. but if a bb's going three inches into gel and a bb may or may not go through a jacket probably not right a 380's going 10 inches into gel there it's night and day all i'm saying is it's not like oh it's barely as much as a bb gun no. right yeah yeah expensive gel is now and it's reusable and everything really interested in stuff people could dig into it if they really want it um all right so 
Are they similar? No, the 380 is, uh, what would you say, about uh, two thirds as much as a 38? If you just had to pick all the different characteristics, you know, put them on a scale. It's, there's a nine millimeter between them at least. So they decided somewhere in the world that we need something between these two or something more than 380 at least. And uh, nine millimeter was adequate. So 380 wasn't so inadequate that it was left behind. It was just just on the realm of what people are looking for. And 38 special, I would say, right, is right in the middle of what people are looking for, power-wise, I think. Uh, you can get way more power out of a handgun, and then it becomes uncontrollable and useless, right? So I think that's something that people don't pay attention to on one side very often. That's why the 45s aren't as popular as they could be. Or if we even 40s, you know, it's just it's more gun to hold on to when you're shooting. How many, um, how many people yeah. carry a 44 nowadays? You know what I mean? Right. I know old guys that did way until they're super old. They might still be carrying them for all I know right. because yeah. for whatever reason, they were so comfortable with it. It's kind of like it's my Harley and I'm used to riding it, but it doesn't mean that that's what somebody's going to jump on brand new. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's not what somebody's going to drive to work every day. Even if they could, oh. could drive it, they don't want it. Correct. Drive it, you know? Yeah. Yep. Right. I'm kind of jumping through. Sorry. So I'm just kind of reading and talking here. Um, uh, I think Roe Call was saying what would be better, the 380 or the 9x18? 9x18, is that Makarov? So mm -hmm. definitely yeah, 380. Makarov. Makarov is only going to find it in some inexpensive guns, which are fine, but lowest bidder, communist, you know, they're neat, but they're not uh, number one thing. You'd want to go grab and get something in 380. Right. You know, you go get something yeah. from Italy, from Beretta, or mm -hmm. something from, you know, Bulgaria. I think I'll get Ballistically, yeah, ballistically, they're very, very similar with a slight edge to the to the Makarov. But the problem with that round, uh, well, they're made to shoot through machine guns, so they're probably a little hotter. Yeah, the problem. Yeah, the the problem though, uh, you know, if you're looking strictly ballistically and power factor, yeah, I mean the Makarov has a little bit of an edge. But then when you look at realistically, right? like the availability or the variety of ammunition that is available for various purposes and whatever self-defense target practice whatever it might be uh, there's it's almost non-existent with mackerel period just almost non-existent i mean you get a ball and that's it like <laughs> mmj is pretty much it uh one flavor one grain weight is it doesn't vary hardly at all um a lot of it is mill syrup. A lot of it can be corrosive. A lot of it, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, there's steel not a case. Lot of, you're not reloading it. It's nicked. yeah, yeah. There's a lot of not a lot of major mainstream manufacturers. You know what I mean? That are making that new anymore. Uh, so you've got that to contend with. And then, as you point out, G, you've also got the variety of firearms too. Like you know, unless you go and those things have crept up in price big time. Like once upon a time, you could pick up. You pick East German, Polish, Hungarian, whatever it might be, Makarovs, you know, under a hundred bucks all day, every day, very, very easily. Yep. Um, yep. And now, I mean, three, four hundred plus, you know, they're they're pricey. So you know, they'd be like, hey, if you please buy one of these Makarovs, we'll throw in a holster and some extra mags and some ammo. Like, just take them. Right. Right. Yep. Right. That was yep. the way it used to be. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of us are caught up in. The what about Tokarov? That, that's a powerful round. Yeah, no. No, what are you going to launch it from? CZ-52? Oh, oh, that's a flamethrower, though, out of a CZ-52. Yeah, they're yeah, neat. Just, they're mm -hmm. not, it's like shooting a Mosin. They're neat. Yeah. In some places, they got their place. You know, if you got to put something in the hunting cabin, then heck yeah. If you got a Makarov, perfect place. For that. When, I, when I qualified for my, what was the CHL back in the day here, uh, mm -hmm. The guy on the line to the right of me was quali doing his qualifications with a CZ-52 and a shoulder holster. So, okay. so there are there are people that uh, that choose that. And there's you know to each their own. Uh, each their own. Knock yourself out. But there's a difference in it was a two hundred dollar or, or a sub one hundred dollar gun then. Oh, at and that time it was sub one hundred. Yeah, for the CZ-52. Yeah. 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 So, 
nothing else is in their fire and dependable. Uh, and they're actually at all outside of the So, uh, yeah. I'm like, now, with a three to four hundred dollar price tag, and you're in a freaking sweet spot of budget firearms at that point, like four hundred dollars in town for handguns. I mean, you have uh, some of the Canics, you have some of the uh, Tauruses, G3, G4. Uh, that's all I can think of. But, uh, oh, you probably something for also. Roll Call had a question. Would it be worth losing a few rounds in my Henry lever action just to get the barrel threaded? Why? Why would you yep. sacrifice? Why would you? I don't. I've what seen this Henry, question. Is this a twenty-two? I don't know what it is, and I don't. I don't understand the question because uh, the gunsmiths I know that could, would do that job, you wouldn't lose any rounds by them. They're they're not going to be chopping the two, the mag tube stuff. Like what they would do is they would essentially pull it down thread the barrel, move the rear sight back, most likely, thread the barrel, and then probably build an extension that moves the can past the mag tube. That way there's no loss of rounds. So my recommendation is going to be don't accept the trade-off. Find somebody competent enough to do it and do it right where you've got the threads and you keep your round count. It's entirely possible. I don't know why it wouldn't be. You might have to take off all that stuff to do what Clover just said, but then, yeah, put a... You're going to have to take all that off and a shroud. it up in a lathe. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But then yeah. put it all back together and then extend the threads, the new threads out. You can keep the same crown, I bet. I mean, I'm not a gunsmith, but I would try to keep the same crown. Yep. Just Absolutely thread the could. outside and then put that, I don't know what to call that, like a you know, steel sleeve, essentially. And then, yeah. But yeah, anyway, most... You know, what what um so maybe talk I, to know, a gunsmithing school and that could be a good challenge for some students yeah what i've had what i've what i've seen done and i've got to had a couple i've had some some barrels that have been chopped previously and, and been it, it extended there are gunsmiths out there that are amazing at what they do i've got a, a ruger it's one of the old school 2245s and um the guy somebody had chopped the barrel down it had like a five and a half inch barrel i think originally and a guy, I had a buddy of mine actually give it to me, and he was always tinkering with stuff or whatever. Anyway, he had chopped and threaded the barrel at like three inches or something, and I'm like, oh, this sucks. And um, so, guess this buddy of mine, he's like, um, yeah, I think I've got a takeoff 22 barrel of some sort here. He's like, I'll just thread this. And I'll, and I'll fit it to where the rifling and everything lines up. And then I'll thread it on there and pin it. You know what I mean? So there's all kinds of, if you're talking about a good competent gunsmith, that is a, a good machinist. Like there's a, there's a difference between a gunsmith that just swaps parts out. Right. Uh, and a gunsmith that legit can like build parts from scratch. I mean, they're a machinist, right? Big difference between the two. The former, I don't call, uh, I don't necessarily call a gunsmith with a parts changer. So, yeah, somebody knows what they're doing. Uh, yeah, very easily. I mean, it, all it takes is they're going to have to strip that down to thread it anyway. Put the barrel in the in the lathe, thread that sucker back. Um, yeah, and then use an old takeoff barrel, an old, you know, something they've got laying around the shop, parts and pieces. Most gunsmiths I know, and especially machinists, they keep any type of metal, right? uh parts and pieces and leftovers they keep that and they keep those for a reason because if you need to make you know an inch and a half two inches worth of extension somehow i mean for them that's super easy to do throw it on the lathe or the mill or whatever they've got to do and go with it so yeah that's my suggestion is get the best of both worlds I, I don't see why it's not possible is it ethical to uh put a suppressor on a lever gun Oh, sure. Lever guns can be cool. Suppressed. My first thing with a lever gun suppressed was at the uh, NRA Museum in Virginia. They've got, I think it's Roosevelt's uh, lever gun with a suppressor on it. And it's uh, 
non-concentric, so it's like uh, it's a it's a cylinder, but the bullet goes through the top of it. You know, if it was a clock, it would like the bullet would go through the twelve o'clock, not through the center of the of the dial. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. it's just super cool. And I saw that whenever I first seen it, and I was like, wait a minute, you could put a suppressor on a lever action, like ding, level achieved or like unlocked. I was like, oh crap, I never thought of that before. So I grew up my whole life not even thinking about putting a lever or a suppressor on a lever. So if we didn't think about putting suppressors on nothing, people don't even know how good they got it nowadays. At least I never thought about putting a suppressor on nothing. I don't know what it's like in Texas or in uh, where Tony was growing up, but uh, there was, I mean, there was cans in movies occasionally, like James Bond would put a can on, but it was a dream to live in a world where you could just go to a store and buy a selection of cans from manufacturers that are competing with each other to make cooler and more better cans. Say that again. So okay. go again, because most of that most of that was broke up, but we heard Hiram Maxim's son. So, so, so I guess make that. Yeah, so Hiram, Hiram Maxim's son invented the suppressor here and trademarked it, or copy whatever you call it, copyright trademark. Anyway, he created it, and they were around seven dollars. And when it went on to the NFA as a two dollar item, it pretty much took it out of the loop. Why would you even want one? Two hundred dollars was a significant amount of money, and again, the item itself was seven bucks. Yep. Yeah, people know. I never this thought about a, the cost of a, them when they were brand new. I remember, I think I remember seeing something about they were so much shipped or something, but I forgot. It's right. a, it's a slippery thing when you start talking about you know suppressors and history and modern times and you know one of the things that you you know you you've got to bring up but you don't want to say it too loudly is you know when you talk about the stamp and inflation and you know all of that like it was a totally different ball game back in the day with the nfa than it is now now it's it's directly opposite right seven dollar suppressor a two hundred dollar stamp nowadays it's a fifteen hundred dollar suppressor and a two dollar and a twenty and a two hundred dollar stamp you know what i mean it's, it's a big difference oh uh, what i hear what you're saying but i'm going to counter it with just because i can i was just listening to I think it was might have been the Plate Society this morning or something else. You know, it's been bleeding together. I've been listening to a lot of two A stuff. But when you take the text history and tradition, uh, that ain't 1934. You know what I mean? It's supposed to be 17 whatever, blah blah blah. So uh, that NFA idea is not going to hang once we start challenging it. So I'm hoping that by the time they figure out that they've missed the boat on. I'm not saying it is. No, I know, I know. I'm just saying by the time they figure it out, though, I'm hoping that it's just gone, you know, so they don't have to ever get a chance to realize what they missed out on. All I'm just, time. I'm flabbergasted that they've never tried. We know how dubious they can be. Yeah, and I think I'm, it just shows I'm, how, and how I'm flabbergasted they are, they right? Never, I'm flabbergasted they never tried to play the, uh, yeah. the inflation, inflation angle because that's something that potentially could be done without any input, any legislation, any anything. All right, they don't do say that all that much. Time. You don't have to say all that. You don't have to say all that. But I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're garbage human beings. And they'll all be action. knocking on wood right now. Everybody's knocking on wood. Everywhere. Well, it's been said multiple times. But, oh, yeah. <clears throat> they have to get a consensus. This show, this show has a lot of reach. I just don't want it to get out there. Um, but yeah, no, I hear you. Uh, we got a couple other questions uh, in here. Yeah, we did. Wait, did Tony get to chime in on would it be worth losing a few rounds in my Henry just to get rid or just to get uh, the barrel threaded? Oh, I agree with you guys. Yeah, no, there's no reason for the compromise if you get, get the right people to handle it. Very possible to even buy, find a takeoff barrel or something somewhere and just put another barrel on it all together. Oh, and like I was saying before, uh, if you, if it's a new purchase or if you're looking at a Henry to be suppressed, I mean, you have, you know, not the big boy. What is it? Steel? No. All weather? 
is the all weather threaded? Yeah, Henry makes makes them pretty much multiple versions that are threaded, but I don't know them all. But they do make. Well, I got a Frontier. I picked up a Henry Frontier that's set up for suppressor. It has a twenty four inch barrel, but it has uh, uh, the capacity already cut back, so you can actually put a th thread of suppressor on it, but still get the tube out enough to load. Right. All right, so uh, the next question comes in from Vu. So that's a new name out there. Thanks for jumping in uh, and asking a question. It says, hey, guys, just hopping in to say what's up. Wanted to know your feelings on ammo scalpers and see if y'all have any issues with them in your neck of the woods. So uh, it's a great question. Actually, I don't know if anyone's ever asked that one before. So how do you guys want to answer that one? I've seen it. I've seen it a lot. But, you know, I've also, you're talking about, you know, a decade plus ago, a long time ago now, good Lord, now that I think about it, you know, running Facebook groups and, you know, gun groups and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it goes with anything, toilet paper, uh, you know, water, whatever, right? Like the whole, oh, there's a shortage, there's a run on stuff, let's, you know, be an opportunistic vulture, right? Um, you know, it runs really close to capitalism, so it's kind of hard to hard to argue against it in my opinion from my standpoint too terribly much i don't let it bother me a whole lot because if people wouldn't buy it um then there wouldn't be people selling it right that's like a market controlled situation too to an extent and especially when there's stuff on the shelf so i know he goes on to say i say he maybe maybe she either way um the person that commented uh, i think they're going to say they're in like oklahoma or whatever now, obviously i'm in texas and like right now there's no need to buy ammo from any type of a scalper. Like it's on the shelves everywhere. It's, it's available in, in any place that normally would sell it. Like there, there's no reason. I mean, maybe some obscure, crazy calibers, but it, it, or cartridges, but it's always been that way with that type of stuff. When you get into some of the more specialty things that are just not produced on a very consistent basis. So, you know, I would say, yeah, I mean, it does. Is it annoying? Yes. Uh, is it just a part of the cycles that we go through and, and seeing that and having to kind of learn to ignore it to an extent? And then when you have the opportunity to advise people that, you know, uh, that person is trying to sell that for this price and you can go down to the, um, you know, local sporting goods store or whatever it might be and get it, you know, $5 a box cheaper or whatever the case may be. Um, there was there was something else. Uh, he was talking about limits too out there, uh, and I'm not even seeing limits anymore in my area and haven't for some time. Um, but I would also keep in mind because this is something that comes up when we talk about this it's like, oh man, there's these scalpers and blah blah blah. And I can remember the post 2013 um run, and especially for me because at that point it was i was really heavy into youth shooting sports we were burning through a lot of 22 uh and that was one of the things back then that that become somewhat difficult uh to get a hold of thankfully we had grant programs and some other things in play that that helped us um but you know i've made my fair share of walmart at six o'clock in the morning uh learned how to play the app and figure out when stuff was coming in and uh, you know, get my three boxes or, or whatever it might be. Um, now I wasn't reselling that. Not that I did not sell some ammunition, uh, back then because I certainly have. Um, but you know, I would pick up my allotted stuff and I mean, that was, you know, it, it got us by doing that. Right. Uh, and yeah, it was annoying cause it was the same old crotchety dudes that was there like every morning. And, you know, as soon as they, got to the parking lot, they proceeded to take pictures and would meet people right there in the parking lot before launch or whatever. It like they literally bought it, took it out of the parking lot and sell it and sold it. And that's, that gets a little bit aggravating because like those people could have went into the store and bought it. Right. And like, you know, literally in the park, but 
then again, I go back to there, if there's a market, if there's somebody buying it, like, I, you know, I don't but know. You know how they have that. that deal where now you can drive up to the parking lot and Walmart brings your stuff out and gives it to your, your car. Mm -hmm. Do they do that for ammo? I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think they do. I doubt that. I doubt that because it's sporting goods. Okay. Um, I don't think so. But I, just real quick, before Tony jumps in, I was going to finish up something and say, since that they did mention mom and pop shops, keep in mind of something. Um, I see when these cycles happen, but they they that there are shops out there that get blamed for gouging, um, which is a little bit different than the whole ammo scalping thing. Um, they do get. Um, blame for that but keep in mind when shortages happen especially your smaller shops they are like the last to get like a little bit of scraps from the distributors they don't get as good of a price yeah and they're so, not buying cases they're buying yeah. boxes yep so that's why mm -hmm. you see a lot of times higher prices with that so just keep that in mind it, you know and i'm not saying some shops don't legitimately gouge <laughs> i mean it's, it's and they can't you know, drop off but, two or three stockers and make the salespeople stock the shelves and yeah. in incorporate fluctuations in prices like that you know they've got an employee yeah. and them their family you know they 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 got them, they've got what do you call it bills to pay yeah i agree with that. everything you guys said but here's the thing make yourself scout proof buy your ammo a little at a time on a regular basis. So you never have to be a part of that silliness. Uh, 20, 2012 taught me that. Uh, and I learned it by accident because what I would do, and it doesn't mean I'm smarter than anybody else. It just meant that I live close enough. To, uh, excuse me. I work close enough to a Walmart and the guys were cool there. Uh, and this is before anything stupid happened. I was just shooting my 22 a lot. And I would go and pick up a 325 round box. Well, they were 20 bucks back then. So I'd buy two. I'd buy one off of pay week and I'd buy two on pay week. And I ended up just by consistency stocking up on 22 long rifle. And I did the same thing with 40 and I did the same thing with nine. I just, you know, uh, circulated through. So when times hit and, 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 and it goes nuts, you already set. Stop just buying every time you go to the range, stopping by the store and picking up a box. Because that's what I think some people do. It's like, yeah, we're going to go have a range day. I want to go pick up two boxes of ammo. No. Pick up a couple boxes a week. I mean, I was doing it when nine was nine ninety nine for a box of 50. Mm -hmm. right. And I was able to stock up to the point that I had thousands of rounds. And not because I dropped money on a case. It was just because I'd buy one round, uh, you know, two boxes of nine a month. And it just adds up. Don't allow yourself to be exploited like this because it, it kind of sucks when it goes nuts and nine millimeters, 50 cent a round for FMJs. Yeah. Uh, so the question, I'll go back to it, is uh, I was talking to Charlie backstage, so I missed whatever you guys said. Um, hey guys, just hope on, or hopped on to see what's up. Want to see what think about ammo scalpers and if you have any issues with them. So, I think you guys probably just from what I heard, you guys probably said a bunch of stuff I would have said, but uh, I guess I was also going to throw in there, um, pretty much what Tony was saying though. But just the, the only way you can have to deal with that is if you need ammo, so don't need ammo. Like right now, you've got online places to buy it, and people are competing with each other. Um, and hopefully you're going to gun shows. So uh, there are the ammunition places, or but there's just good deals. You go to some place and somebody's got like a partial box. There's there's uh, some department bought too much, so they're the, the shop that sold it to them uh, couldn't sell it all, so they've got pallets of it. That's how I bought it. I get a lot of my ammo from the, somebody buying too much, thinking they're going to sell it to the border patrol, and the border patrol is done buying it that month. So they got an extra pallet of it, you know, something went wrong and they're just selling it for ridiculous prices. Find something like that. There might be a prison nearby that does training. And two months after training, a very ammo, all the ammo they didn't use. Maybe all the officers uh, go to, you know, get 10 boxes. They all shoot four and take the six to the gun show. Or one of them takes 60 to the gun show. You don't know. So go hang out at gun shows and find out. Um, and, and then, like Tony said, stock up on it. Um, the, 
we're going to see shortages deliberate and unintentional. I don't know if Clover mentioned this when he was saying it, uh, but we've had shortages when uh, factory said, well, everything's good, good to go. So I'm just going to, this is a good time to upgrade. I'm going to shut down my production for the Western hemisphere and no big deal. And then I remember 22 did that, whatever year this was, it might've been, I think it was like nine or six or back in the day, like some 22 factory decided we'll just shut down Western hemisphere production or something like that. Like everything on this half of the globe that was supplied by this ammunition, this 22 ammo was like, no, we're going to upgrade. And then something burned down in the process. So then they're like, well, I guess we're definitely going to upgrade because we have to start from scratch now. And then at the same time, Europe said, okay, 22 is legal. What the heck? And then boom, you couldn't buy 22 anywhere. It was like a million dollars a box. Everybody wanted 22 all of a sudden. And that's when the internet was just around and long enough for everybody to go, hey, some people are buying too much 22. Because if they see an old guy go in there and buy boxes and boxes of 22, they go, oh, he's hoarding, right? They don't think like, oh, that guy takes that 22 to the youth shooting club or whatever. And just, you know, dozens of kids are shooting that this week. I can't tell you the number of donations we got during that time that people would call me up and go, hey, I've got some 22 if y'all need it, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah, absolutely. And it'd be you got, multiple you boxes. Got, oh, I got like grand grand children and you know, and twenty-two is cheap or twenty-two is getting uh, hard to get. Like, well, I'm gonna keep taking my grandchildren shooting, so I'm gonna go buy some twenty two. It's not necessarily hoarding. Uh, and unfortunately, even though I hate to admit it, sometimes even with nine millimeter, that's being ordered so that people can recreationally shoot. It is legal to recreationally shoot nine millimeter, and some people actually enjoy it. I don't know. So I think uh, the scalpers are frustrating, and the people that bring it up. I mean, there are douchebags who just do what, what they're saying, like go to the store and buy it for seven bucks a box and then sell it for 17, I guess. To some extent, that is capitalism. They're just helping the douchebags who are willing to pay 17 bucks a box to not have to wait in line early in the morning. So that's like getting mad at people that buy iPhones cheap or get iPhones, period, or the super Sony PlayStation or whatever the thing is that's trendy. And then turn around and sell it. I mean, what are you going to get mad at the way people exist? Like, it's just like, get in line and buy it, or go do it. Like, you can't, you can't stop that. That's just, that's not even black market, is it? That's just right. essentially. I'm going to go wait in line for you for ten well, bucks. All right. Okay. Yeah. Go wait in line for me in the morning, and you can you know, get three people to do that, and you technically make thirty bucks to wait in line. I mean, that's, that's all yeah. they did. They didn't hurt nobody. Nothing got. You know, there's nothing nefarious. They essentially just stood in line for somebody. So either go stand in line or pay for them to stand in line for you and shut up about it. So, I, I mean, I'm not saying to uh, comment, not shut up about it, but in general, the comments that we've had in the past about people who are like, I'm entitled to have an ammunition at the price I want on the shelf when I want it, and I shouldn't have to wait in line, and I should be able to just walk in. Like, I don't know what world you live in. Appreciate what we've got. You know, we've come from a place where we didn't even have the variety or the ability. We had nothing to shoot it in. And now we have all these things to shoot it in and places to shoot it. We've got people to talk about it all with. This is a uh, golden age, if not you know, on the road well, to an even better golden age. But anyway. Well, we've also got. You've also got the issue, I mean, these companies, the ammunition manufacturers, like, like they do some forecasting with certain things with kind of being able to tell the future, right? But they can't really, they don't know unforeseen circumstances, things out their control, things they can't plan for, things they you can't see coming. You know, and that could be some type of legislative effort. That could be some type of a run on the market for whatever tragedy thing that's happened in the world or maybe a legislative effort. Fire, right, is one of those. Damage, uh, maybe it's not even a fire. Maybe it's some type of natural disaster, which fire is, of course, one of them. Um, and then also keep in mind that where these unforeseen things happen in the cycle of ammo production makes a difference too because what happens when you know some unforeseen set of circumstances comes together and like there's a run on let's just use nine millimeter because it's super popular around even though it probably shouldn't be um and let's say something happens and the ammunition manufacturers they don't make all calibers 24 7 365 all the freaking time they tool up and tool down 
once they get to a certain output of something and they and they have that and they're like okay let's switch the tool over for a week or two or a month or whatever we're going to run this this cartridge or this caliber right and they're constantly moving the machines around and retooling to do all that so what happens when some of these you know unforeseen circumstances happen in the middle of that right like they are not ramped up balls of the wall cranking out nine millimeter now there's a run on nine millimeter because of whatever weird thing or something has happened you know and they're in the middle and they're in the middle of making their 40 foot you know making their 45 act so it's like a week or two or something they can't just shut that down they spend all the time tooling that up and doing everything else and if they don't then they're, that's going to run out they're not going to have any of that so that it puts them behind the curve i guess is what i'm saying a lot of a lot times of what they'll do is they'll run all the decent calibers with their best employees and when those good employees take a vacation they just hire winos and street people to come in and make the nine millimeter oh yeah i'm sure yeah yeah oh no, my yeah. goodness hey definitely, guys i gotta definitely go counts. <laughs> Gotta go. Right. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. I'll talk to you guys next week. Okay, okay. take it easy. Bye. Couldn't handle that kind of nine millimeter talk. Um. <laughs> all right. So I don't know if we had any other questions. Uh, there's a question about some other topics in the uh, questions that were coming in over on the spreadsheet, but I think we hit all the ones that were live tonight. Good. Um. Or yeah, this afternoon, Tony out there. Now, Tony out there was saying you didn't blag it, but when we were talking about the curbside pickup, he said he couldn't even get pellets curbside pickup. So, yeah, I'm guessing he means BBs, right? So, yeah, that's messed up. I wonder if they'll even bring out like propane or I don't know, butane tanks. You know, it's yeah, something they might just be scared that they're. I'm sure, and and I'll and I'll be honest with you, that's going to be that's going to be store policy stuff. Not even company policy stuff, right? But a lot of that'll be store policies. Just yeah, like, you go out to some place that's next to the all, trailer place yeah. in the Rule King, and they're going to be like, "Yeah, we'll take out some ammo." Yeah. What do you want? I've got yeah. a I've got a uh, sister in law that has been she's been a manager at Walmart's for because she's been manager at several uh, for a very very long time now. Good lord, she's got twenty years into Walmart probably. She's got a day, and. Um, yeah, so I know this to be true. Like we we've seen a lot in the past that we've seen these press releases with quote unquote company policy from Walmart or whatever. And she's like, Yeah, but Walmart also has a lot of leniency as far as the store and what their store managers allow and actual store policy too. So um, you know, you may may not be the case where Tony went, but then you know, I may be able to go do it here. I mean, it's entirely possible. So um just keep that in mind. All right. So, um, anything I didn't get a chance to ask you at the beginning of the show? Anything uh, come up over the last couple of weeks now? Since it's been a couple of weeks since we chatted on this show, uh, that might have come up where you thought, "Oh, I'm going to bring that up on the Ask One Question show." No, I mean there probably has been, but I mean, there probably has been, but I can't I can't think of anything. Yeah, no worries. So throw that out just as a sort of a palate cleanser, kind of let us go back to uh, the show itself. Uh, let's see. So we go live on Saturdays. I have a background on here about from yesterday. I wonder, I don't even think I have one really from for this show. So I just go back to my normal patch selection back there. Uh, let's see. This is Saturday, though, after this show. Uh, you'll find G23 is taking the day off for doing something in real life. And uh, then later on, Brooke Cheney will do the uh, Suicide Prevention Saturday. It took me a second to reset there. And then after that, or a bit, maybe a bit after that, will be uh, Hillbilly Up. That's his Saturday show. This after, this evening, overnight, the overnight show from DM Foss. I don't know if that one is posted yet or not. Saturday. So, uh, There's a lot going on on Saturday, typically. Yeah, so that's pretty much the rundown. I think I'm just missing G23. Before this show, you had the Plate Society podcast. That one was just on. And uh, yeah, thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll be back next week. Clover and I will be back on Tuesday to uh, do some Gun Channels coaching. Uh, we had a suggestion from She Fires last week to talk about uh, how to stay away from toss and terms of service issues, how to stay out of YouTube jail, so to speak. 
Uh, so we'll be talking about that this week. Um, and tomorrow, then we'll with... tomorrow we've got Ghost and Clover. Oh, okay. You got it. Uh, you don't. You, do you bring topics to that, or is that open topic? Yeah, we bring topics, but they're not announced ahead of time. Oh, okay. So we do that. That way I don't know what he's going to bring up and he doesn't know what I bring up until it's done brought up. And then obviously the random viewer topic is we don't know what that's going to be until oh, it's okay. time. So, yeah. So is that every week or every other week? Uh, every other Sunday is how we've got it set up. Now that that'll change because um, we'll have this week and then the next one will be we'll be at NRA. We'll be in Indy. And so we're probably going to end up having to skip two weeks. Um, but either way, I mean, we got it set up to go every, every two weeks. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. We hit it right at an hour, so it can be done. It is possible. No one can say we haven't done it or we never did it because we just did it. All right. I'll throw a quick commercial up for our store. If you want to grab something from over there, that's one of the ways that we keep doing what we're doing. We all have Patreon. So if you'd like to subscribe to our projects, uh, go over to patreon.com. And check out uh, some stuff over there and support what you value. 